Welcome in. It is Big Ten Today as presented by Old National Bank on this Wednesday. Really good to have you with us. Dave Revson, Rafael Davis. We'll talk about Michigan State and the Sweet 16 a little bit later in the show as well. But let's start with Wisconsin providing a little good hoops news on the men's side. It would have been Wisconsin if they weren't in a close game and they didn't find a way to win it down the stretch. They are playing good basketball right now, and I love that they're still playing for something. You see them in the locker room after the win. They're celebrating. Coach Guard is throwing around water. It doesn't matter to them that this is the NIT. They still want to win a championship. Why should go to Vegas? Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't <laughs> want to do that? That is uh, our big story. It is the Badger win last night onto the NIT semis for the first time in school history after taking down Oregon 61-58. Wisconsin pulled it out despite shooting just 33% from the field. They got 18 from Max Klesman. They got 12 from Chucky Hepburn. They rallied from six down with less than four minutes left to pull out the W. Now, I do think it is fair to point out Oregon was without three injured starters, but still home court advantage for the Ducks. They had played really well these first two rounds of the NIT without those guys. What did you take from Wisconsin's win? that they're still playing for something like we just talked about. They still have energy. They're not going out there and just going through the motion. I've been at Purdue and I played in the CBI at home in Mackey and lost. We had guys not wanting to be there because it wasn't the NCAA tournament. But these guys, they're still trying to get better and they're still playing the right way. You look at a guy like Max Klesmet. He was injured a little bit this season, tried to find his way, and now he's a pivotal piece in this Wisconsin team. It's giving them more confidence going into the next year when they win some games because only two teams at the end of the year, maybe three if you look at the CBI, they get in their season on a winning streak. In Wisconsin, they have that chance. Yeah, I'm with you on Klesman. He's been really good here in the NIT. He's averaging about 14 points per game in these three games. There was a moment that really stood out to me in watching this game last night that kind of gave you a sense of how dialed in they were. It was coming out of a timeout, and Oregon went to a 1-3-1 zone. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Wisconsin dissected it so yep. beautifully yep. And, and got an open three that they hit. And, and it really struck me, and maybe you can speak, you can, not maybe, you can speak to this a lot more than I can. But it seems to me that if you're not in the game yep. mentally, yep. You don't react in that moment like Wisconsin react. Am I reading too much into no. that? or Because I, I, that moment really stood out to me. No, I agree with you. Because you look at who made that pass to Chucky Hepburn. It was Tyler Wall. And for the game, Tyler Wall was one for nine from the field. and only had five points. So that means he was still bought in to winning the game and playing the right way. He wasn't bought in to just scoring the ball on the offensive end. He didn't feel as though... I have to score. We're going to lose. He saw the skip pass. It was a great cross-court pass. And Chucky Hepburn stepped into it and knocked it down. And you could see how much it meant to them when he made that shot, but also the bench's reaction. They felt the moment of that shot. But like you said, that 1-3-1, one, one, if you're not bought into the game, if you're not paying attention to the timeout or what's going on in practice, knowing that Oregon comes out of timeouts and plays that 1-3-1, one, one, you're not going to know what's going on. And then I like what they did on the glass. Oregon being one of the better offensive rebounding teams in the Pac-12, averaging around 11 per game. Wisconsin is a team that doesn't go to the offensive glass, and they get nine of them. They're plus nine on the glass, and they really limited Oregon's second-chance opportunities. And that was big time because when you don't score the ball well, when you're not getting shots on the inside, I mean, Oregon was beating everything up at the rim. You have to find other ways to steal baskets, and Wisconsin was able to do it. That stood out to me, too, that Wisconsin went to the offensive glass because it is not, to your point, something they traditionally do. Let's just be honest. They traditionally are more efficient offensively (laughs) than they've been this year. I mean, scoring is a challenge for this team and has been for much of the year. And if you are in that situation, it does feel like it makes sense to try to steal some more possessions. And they're always going to be a low turnover team, although the first half of this game, they were not. They were turning it over left and right. They figured that out in the second half. But the ability to adapt and to say, hey, we are just not, for whatever reason, they can't dump it inside and get to. They did in the Bradley game. They haven't really done it since then. They certainly didn't do it last night where they were in the mid-30 percentage, uh, mid-30s from two-point range. But to be able to get on the glass to steal some possessions, that was really their formula for winning. It was big time. And then you add that along with the ability to move the basketball. Because like you said, 
Throwing the ball in to Steven Crowd and getting the bucket wasn't necessarily an option. Driving the ball off the dribble, getting to the rim, that was getting beat up. And the only way to beat that type of rim pressure is with ball movement. 15 assists on 21 field goals. Everyone was getting a touch. When you're guarding the, when you're guarding the offense and you're guarding for 25 seconds, you're going to break down. And it looked as though Wisconsin got back to that style of play, that ball movement, that control of the tempo. You look towards the end of the game, Wisconsin goes 5-6 or six to win the game from the field. And, and Oregon scores one field goal in the last three minutes. Their defense locked in. So when we can't score, you can't score, and they stop turning the ball over. You mentioned the eight turnovers in the first half, but just two in the second half. And then where guys start to feel comfortable, different guys stepped up. And this one, it was Klesman at Hepburn. In the previous game, it was Hepburn with 27. Different guys are having their moment. But this comes with a good locker room. These guys are still bought in. Even though Jordan Davis didn't affect the game, that much offensively, but he was the first guy in the locker room jumping around, celebrating his teammates. This team still wants to win, and it's special to see at this point in the season. He was great on the glass as well. Some really good hustle plays. And you mentioned it. They just figure out a way in these close games. I mean, it's remarkable. Again, they've played 20 games now, decided by five points or fewer. It's far and away the most in the nation. They've won 13 of them. So it goes down to the wire. You're winning 65% of those games you feel Pretty good about yourself. They're going to get North Texas next in the NIT. That game's coming up next week, uh, Tuesday in Las Vegas. Mean Green advancing with a win in overtime at Oklahoma State last night. Two more spots are up for grabs tonight. Cincinnati facing Utah Valley. UAB is going to take on Vanderbilt. This is a good UNT program. Uh, Grant McCaslin is the coach, at least for now. Uh, there's a lot of talk about whether or not he might end up at Texas Tech replacing Mark Adams, who, of course, was let go in, in a little bit of a, uh, not a little bit, a very uncomfortable situation there uh, just a week or so ago, and, and he's being mentioned for that job. But this is a team, as we know, they beat Purdue a couple of years ago in the NCAA tournament. I'm sorry to bring that up, but, <laughs> but it, I only bring it up to reinforce that this is a good right, program. Right. And uh, this is a, an unusual team in that they, like we think Wisconsin plays slow, mm -hmm. There's literally no one in the country yeah. who plays at a slower tempo than North Texas does. I mean, they are going to grind it out. They are more than happy to grind it out with the Badgers. And Tyler Perry is a player. He can get a bucket at any, time, any point in the game. He's averaging 17 on the season. But in his NIT last three games, he scored 20-plus points. So I expect Max Klesmit, Chucky Hepburn, to put a body on him. And with North Texas... North Texas, it starts with Perry. If you can take him out of the game, you can make him uncomfortable, turn the ball over a little bit, you can make their whole offense uncomfortable because they don't score the ball at a high rate. They don't get much from two. He makes a boatload of threes, 42% from three. So if you can slow him down, you slow them down. But on the flip side, they're tough to score on. They're, you look at Kim Palm, they're number eight in the country at two-point defense, two point percentage defense. So you got to throw the ball in there, Tyler Wall, and then the Stephen Crown have them be effective. They don't have the shot blockers that Oregon did. So I expect those two to have a good one. But offensively, continue to move the ball. Don't try to beat it with dribble and beat it with your passes. Yeah, opponents shoot 39% against the Mean Green, seventh in the country. So really defensive-oriented team. I mentioned McCasland and – you know, whether or not he is or is not going to ultimately be the coach at Texas Tech, it's out there. It's floating around. So assuming that it doesn't somehow come to a resolution between now and then, which it very well might, right. but let's just say this drags on for a few days. Do you see that potentially as a distraction for UNT's team? No, I don't think so. I think that this is a team at this point in the season, they know what to expect from each other on the court. So sometimes you may see – your head coach, he may leave practice and go out and recruit, and now your assistants, they're leading practice. And if you have that respect from your head assistant and your other assistant coaches to your players on the floor, and you have a mature locker room, it won't matter too much on the floor, especially when you have a guy like Perry who really leads the offense. Sometimes when you're missing your head coach, guys look around as who should shoot the ball. Maybe this is our opportunity to get some shots up. But they have a go-to guy already. He's the leader of the team. So I don't, I don't expect him to cause too much chaos. And again, we talk about the identity. Like, when you are literally 363rd in tempo out of 363 teams in the country, That's crazy. that means you're bought in, though, yes. right? I mean, it means yes. that everyone, hey, this is what we do. You're a disciplined team. And they're going to look at Wisconsin and think, man, <laughs> these guys are running gun. <laughs> I mean, That's hilarious. These guys really That's get up true. and down the court. I don't know whether we can keep up with them. <laughs> the NCAA tourney resumes tomorrow. Michigan State will battle Kansas State in the Sweet 16 at Madison Square Garden. Spartans are the early game. Winner of that one gets either FAU or Tennessee 
in the Elite Eight on Saturday. That gets us to our big stat. It's brought to you by Old National Bank. Here's how these two have fared statistically in the first two games of the tourney. K-State is an up-tempo team. They're going to put up points. They've shot it great. They're undersized. They don't rebound it well. MSU has really defended well in the dance. They faltered a bit, of course, on that end down the stretch. Let's start, though, when Michigan State has the ball. So Michigan State on offense against that Kansas State D. What stands out to you in that part of the matchup, Rafael? I like the, how Michigan State has kind of flipped their offense at this point in the season. Coming into the tournament, even into the Big Ten tournament, they have been blistering the nets from three. Jay Nakins had been in the groove, making shots from deep, even Tyson Walker. But here in the first two games in the tournament, they're plus 28 in the paint, and they've shot 26 more free throws than USC and Marquette combined. So they're doing it in a different way. Joey Hauser's been big time. I like when you look at their three guards. All three guards do something different. You look at A.J. Hogar, he sets the table. He can get downhill and play at the rim. Tyson Walker is a bucket. He's probably one of the – Rick Pizzo calls him the best tough shot maker in the league, maybe in the country. He's 17 of his 23 points coming in the second half. When you need a basket, you can give the ball to Tyson and clear it out. And then Jay Nakins, he's turned into a guy that can make shots from deep. And you speak about Jay Nakins, during the tournament – he just won for 10 from the three-point line. So it's a matter of time before he starts making shots. So I like the way Hauser's playing. I think you still need a little bit more production from Malik Hall, especially when you look at Kansas State and you look at him inside. I think Malik can really get some offensive rebounds, steal some points there. But offensively, I like how they've gotten to a tough style of play, and they're not dependent on making shots. Yeah, you talked about they went to the free throw line 48 times in those first two games. And we don't think of them as a team. They certainly haven't had a lot of low post threats this year, right? right? I mean, we've kind of talked a lot about the five spot as being an area of concern. But to your point, there are lots of ways to score inside, What, right? And one of them is driving the ball. Yep. And you think about the last game, they were 12 of 13 at the rim in that game against Marquette. So, I mean, that's astounding, right? Like, when, when you get there, you make it. And then if you don't, you get to the free throw line and convert. So... It feels to me in a weird sort of way like they've almost flipped a little bit to to going back to kind of who we think of them as historically, right? They've been really tough here Mm -hmm. down the stretch. They've been physical inside, to your point, getting to the free throw line. They've been good on the glass. That's a Tom Izzo team. It's just not really the the Tom Izzo team that we've seen during the course of this year. No, I think it's because they went through so much adversity during the year. You think about starting the season without Jay Nakins. You lose Malik Hall. You take a couple couple losses in that stretch. You get smacked at Notre Dame. You take a loss to Northwestern at home, which at the time – may have felt like a worse loss than it ended up being. The heartbreaking loss to Purdue. So they've been through the ups and downs of a season, and now they're just playing good ball. Now they they are really buying in to what Coach is saying in the locker room. I really think that Iowa game, that woke them up. Yeah. Because now you get up 18-5 against Marquette, and the next thing you know, you're down five. And they don't rattle. They didn't shake. They didn't look nervous. They just kept playing and kept playing the right way. And you got guys like A.J. Hogar who's buying in because you talk about going 12 or 13 from layups. That's from the guards. That's those guys going in, being tough, finishing at the rim. Because now if their offense can match what their defense is doing, they could be special. They could get to Houston, no doubt. Got a little bit from Sissoko as well. But right, primarily, no doubt, primarily it was the guards. A little concerned about the turnovers because Kansas State is going to turn you over. And Michigan State, we have seen them be susceptible to that through the years. What about the flip side? I mean, to me, the biggest difference in Michigan State versus what we saw in the last half dozen games at the end of the year is defense. They were giving up 1.2 points per possession in the final six games, which is dreadfully bad. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to win that way. Less than a point per possession in these first two games against USC and Marquette. What's different? Is it just toughness or is there more to it than that? I think it starts with their toughness and their buy-in because you talk about turnovers. In the first two games, they forced USC and Marquette to turn it over 27 times, and they scored 35 points off of their turnovers. So they're turning defense into offense, and then their individual defensive pride has been better. You look at a guy like Boogie Ellis, one of the better scorers in the country, Peterson on that US, USC team, they get 17 points on 22 shots. You go to Marquette, you know it comes down to can you guard Cam Johnson? and can you take Kolick out of the game 21 points on 21 shots and they turn it over together just the two of them seven times so when you have Tyson Walker AJ Hogarth and those guys 
believing in that individual defense on that end, that's what makes this matchup special because in this game, you got another duo, Marquise Noah and Keontae Johnson. And again, I expect Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogarth to take that responsibility. And Matty Sissoko, his athleticism, his toughness at the rim, he's a valuable rim protector. He may not be seven foot, seven one, but he has athleticism out of the gym. And you bring in some weak stuff. They're going to beat it up. So you got those two guards keeping you out of lane. You get past them. You got some big guys down low. And even a guy like Joey Hauser, he's bringing some toughness. He's getting eight, ten rebounds a game. He's not Brandon Dawson athletically, but he's giving that type of production on the offensive end. And defensively, he's not giving up much. What's the particular challenge here? Uh, Kansas State really up-tempo. They are the fastest team tempo-wise. We're in the Big 12 during the conference season this year. So this is a team that loves to get up and down. Historically, that's how we think about Michigan State, too. Been a little bit less so this year, but my sense is that doesn't phase them. Would you agree? No, I think they're going to be more comfortable. I think Kansas State running, that's going to bring it out of Michigan State. You get A.J. Hogarth pushing the tempo, Tyson Walker, Jay Nakins. That's what they want to do. So then you have Joey Hauser trailing for three. But I think the biggest one in this one, like you said, Dave, is taking care of the basketball for Michigan State. Can they can they win the rebound war and steal some second chance points on the glass? And then making Marcus Noah uncomfortable. If he's comfortable coming off of that ball screen, rather if it's getting his pull up or getting to the basket, throwing lobs at the rim, that's when they're dangerous. If you can make Noah uncomfortable, keep a body on him, don't let him have any free looks, and get a body on him in transition. I remember we used to prepare for play in Michigan State, and we would give our backup point guard a head start and let him go, and we have to go catch up to him. Hmm. But if you can stop Marcus Noah from getting in transition, you take a lot of their offense out of play, and then making Johnson uncomfortable as well. I think A.J. AJ Hogarth with his size, his toughness, and his strength, he can push Johnson out a little bit, turn him into a jump shooter only and keep a hand up. I think those two guys, they make them go. If you make those two guys uncomfortable, it'll be tough for them. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you combine the usage rate of those two guys, it's basically 50%, yeah. right? So, I mean, those guys are – they're so heavily oh. – dependent on the two of them. Two good guys to depend on, (laughs) by the way, right? I'm not necessarily saying that as a negative. I'm just saying you know what you're getting here. And and you do get a team that's susceptible to turning it over. We were talking about the flip side of Kansas State turns teams over. They turn it over themselves, too. Michigan State forced turnovers on about 24% of Marquette's possessions. They did a great job on Kolick, as you were talking about. Is there anything in that blueprint that would apply to, to this game against Kansas State? They got three guards, and you can pressure every single one of those guards. And then the thing on the other side is you attack them. So you attack Marcus Noel with Tyson Walker. You attack Johnson with A.J. Hogard. And like Kolick, you get those guys in some foul trouble, and then it disrupts everything. But I think for Michigan State, the flip side of it is it could be Joey Hauser going off. It could be A.J. Hogard. Maybe Malik Hall comes off the bench and give great offensive production. They have multiple guys that can score the ball offensively. That's why I like them in this game because you look at Kansas State. They have two guys, and I trust Michigan State, two defenders, and they're multiple scorers against that. Should be fun. There are going to be a lot of points scored in this game, and Kansas State was the highest scoring team in the Big 12 in conference play, about 76 points per game. And as you saw, they've kind of mirrored that here so far in the NCAA tournament. Minnesota on Monday, naming Don Plitza White, its new women's basketball coach, comes to Minnesota from West Virginia, where she spent just one season coaching the Mountaineers to the NCAA tourney this year. It was the fourth straight team she has taken to the dance, including a sweet 16 run a year ago at South Dakota. Don Plitzawide joins us now to talk about her new position. Coach, congratulations. What have these last few days been like for you? Well, it's been it's been a whirlwind in sorts, but it's been a lot, a lot of fun and had a chance to meet the young ladies here. And certainly that's been great for us. Well, you mentioned the young ladies there. Uh, Lindsey Whalen obviously recruited really well. They had a great freshman class this year. A number of these players have already said that they are going to stay on board. So it's not like this is a total rebuild here. Give me a sense of kind of what you see when you evaluate this program and where you can take it here in the short term. 
Well, I certainly believe that we have some young ladies who are really hungry and energetic and excited to do well and and willing to jump in and get started right away. And so that's been something that's been really fun. It's been we started our workouts on Tuesday and getting after it. And they've been they ask a lot of good questions. You know, they want to do things the way that that we want them to do them. And so it's been a lot of a lot of there's been a lot of energy with the group so far. I bet you made the Sweet 16 at South Dakota. You did it with a roster chock full of players from the state of Minnesota. To what extent do you believe that you can build a program largely around Minnesota natives? Well, we've had a great, I've been in coaching for a few years, you know, I don't, don't want to tell you the exact number, but quite a few of those years have been recruiting in the state of Minnesota. And we really believe that there's a tremendous amount of talent in our state. There are some great players, but also they've been really well coached. And so our, our goal is to really develop our recruiting base and continue to keep it centered around the state of Minnesota and around our region. You use the term process oriented to describe what you do. Can you elaborate on the process? Like, give me a sense of and what did you start with? You know, you mentioned you've already worked out some of these players. What did that entail? And what is the process of going from starting anew at a program to turning it into a competitive NCAA tournament type team? Well, the first thing that we talked about is what it it takes from a competitive standpoint. And so certainly the first goal for us was to find a way to compete in all the drills that we were working on, whether that is, you know, scoring around the rim in different ways, whether that's in just strictly finishing plays, you know, or or taking care of the basketball in some of the two-on-two, three-on-three, four-on-four scenarios. But being highly competitive is really the first thing that we are focusing on. And so when you learn to compete in, in all the things that you're doing, Sometimes you can find a way to be successful, even though it wasn't exactly what you planned it out to be. You know, there are possessions, for example, you, you go to score the ball around the rim, but you don't finish it on the first possession and you tip it, tip it, keep it alive. Or maybe it takes four offensive rebounds to put it back in. We kind of joke and we say players are padding their stats at that point in time. <laughs> but really, ultimately, the first focus for us is, is to, to compete at a really high level. You are from Wisconsin. You have spent some time in this conference. You were assistant coach early in your career at the University of Wisconsin, then worked with Kevin Borseth at the University of Michigan. To what extent did your familiarity with this league make this job appealing to you? It made it a great appeal for for me personally, for our family, you know. But really, the the understanding of the Big Ten and and how competitive the teams are, you know, and what the recruiting base is, all of those all those factors came into making this decision. And and for me personally, an opportunity to return to our home area, really, and to be around our family. And so that's been something that you know really has been fun for us to reconnect with a lot of the the coaches. You know, but also to have some family around as well. You mentioned your family. You grew up on a farm in Wisconsin, north of Milwaukee. How did that lifestyle and kind of that childhood influence the coach that you've become? Well, I think the three expectations within our program are, are directly related to who, how I was raised. You know, my parents both worked full time and we farmed on the side. And so it was, it was get home from work or get home from school and then start farming when farming is really a full time job in and of itself. And so I think the, the work ethic, the, the understanding of being in the moment, the understanding of finding a way all came from how I was raised. And I'm really blessed and really fortunate fortunate to now be back close to home. What was your most favorite and least favorite farm chore, Coach? <laughs> uh, least favorite was probably baling hay. That was hot. That was hard. But I, I feel like I got a lot stronger doing that. Uh, most favorite? I don't know that I really had a most favorite. I'm not going <laughs> to lie about that. that. They're all pretty hard and challenging. But, you know, the least favorite was definitely baling hay. The term chore kind of implies not really a favorite, right? Like no that, one that's really, exactly right. No one really embraces the notion of chores. Uh, you met your, your husband, Jay at a high school all-star game. You're both really good high school basketball players in Wisconsin. you got a son who plays college basketball, a daughter who plays college basketball. 
how much does basketball dominate your world in your home, your discussions, your interactions with your family? Well, it's obviously a major part of who we are and what's certainly what's going on in their lives right now. They're right in the middle of it. They're in the middle of their their college careers, and it's been a big part of our life for a long time because of that. But I think ultimately it, there's a competitiveness in our family and everything that we do. So card games get pretty heated. Uh, of course, there's a one-on-one game or two-on-two. Last time I played two-on-two, it, it became a little bit uh, a little challenging for for my husband and I to keep up with those two college athletes. <laughs> and trying to play with those guys. But, you know, there are four point guards in our family, so there are, are a lot of people who are trying to say, this is how we should do things, or let's go compete, or let's get after it. Do you pick their brains at all when you think about your team? I mean, legitimately, they, they obviously all know the game really well. Do, do you talk X's and O's they, and, and ask for advice? Might be the wrong word, but feedback? Well, our family gives me a lot of feedback. I don't even know that I have to ask for it all the time. You know, but really, they, they see things, and they see things at a really high level. And so it's been a lot of fun to share with each other those experiences. Well, what's the balancing act between parenting your kids and coaching them, like the flip side of what we're talking about here? Well, it's, it's challenging for me personally because I don't really get to see our kids play in person very often and so I get to watch them online a lot of times either live during their games or catch you know download the games and watch them later and so what I really focus on is how many times did you huddle your team up you know did you get them together at free throws did you go offensive or defensive rebound those type of things did you play really hard so those are the areas that 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 I focus on in talking to our kids about their games. Coach, this is Women's History Month. I'm interested as you talk about influences on you. Who are the women who have inspired you to do what you do? Well, the neat part about it is that one of the the females who really had a, a great impact on me is Jane Albright, and and we worked together for you know a time at the University of Wisconsin, and she's someone who continues to reach out and continues to stay connected, but someone who I think just did a tremendous job of building the excitement uh, around you know Wisconsin women's basketball at the time when I was there. We opened the Cole Center and had over sixteen thousand fans in the first in the first get the first contest, and so you know really have a, a great great deal of respect for Jane. Jane introduced me to Pat Summit, so that was really pretty special, you know, and, and so she's she's someone who still is of great impact, a uh, great influence in my life, and someone who obviously, you know, has been in the Big Ten, so we'll have to pick her brain for some more ideas now. Coach, that was certainly a, a while ago when the Cole Center opened the Big Ten. Women's basketball, I think, was, was different. There were certainly some really strong teams in that time as well, but you look at the league right now, Three teams in the Sweet 16. You had a number one seed that they got bounced out as well in Indiana. So a really strong league as you have observed it from the outside since you last were an assistant in the league under Coach Borseth. Why do you think it's kind of had this resurgence here? What do you attribute that to? Certainly, I believe that there are two reasons why. One is because there is a great level of there are great coaches in the league, and and I think the great coaches in the league have done a tremendous job of bringing in great talent to to the league. And so, when you put some pair up some great coaches with some top notch talent, obviously, then you have an opportunity to play at a really high level, and we're seeing that right now. New Minnesota women's coach Don Plitzewhite, coach, congratulations. Really appreciate your time and best of luck. Looking forward to watching your teams compete here starting next season. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Coach, congratulations. You've won so many of these, but I would say this one in some ways was, I don't want to say considered an upset, but you look at where you guys were seated coming into the tournament. What makes this one particularly special? Well, I think uh, I've been fortunate to, uh, to have won a few of them so each one uh, has been special this one uh, was obviously very special just from some of the things that transpired within our season some of the adversity that we uh, we went through in January then again in February and uh, you know whether it was unexpected I don't know but uh, you know in January if you told me we were going to play in the national championship game I I, I don't know I, it would have been <laughs> a little bit uh, far-fetched but uh, it's interesting uh, 
you know, to watch a group uh, come together. Uh, and uh, as I, I said, the last month of the season, we were in a good space. We were playing very well. And there was just a matter of uh, we were going to be able to put things together and get ourselves an opportunity. And when that opportunity presented itself, uh, we were certainly prepared. And uh, I'm still sort of, it's still surreal to me. I'm still trying to figure out, you know, how this thing happened. If you look at our bracket and what we were able to accomplish, accomplish the last three games. Yeah, I'd be fascinated to go back a little bit here with you because you talk about January. And for those who don't know, you guys lost five games in a row. And just to put that in perspective, that tied for the longest losing streak in the history of the program. So I'd be really curious to know if there's anyone else who's ever won a national championship, frankly, in any sport in a year where they tied for the longest losing streak in the history of the program. And let's just say you lost to really good teams in that stretch. It wasn't like you were playing terrible hockey but that being said, as you try to put a finger on where you were two months ago and where you are now, what changed here? Well, I think uh, several things changed. One is, uh, you know, your ability to, to dig down deep in a rabbit hole and figure it out, you know, what happened in those five games. And as we came out of that uh, with the understanding that, yeah, in, in all those games except the last one at Ohio State, uh, you know, we had played well enough to win. We just didn't win. We weren't scoring enough. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, we had played some of the top teams in the country at Quinnipiac for two, came home against Duluth. Uh, you know, and they were in the semi or the championship game a year ago in the national tournament with a lot of players back. And then we ended up our last two games at Ohio State. And so it wasn't like we were playing, uh, you know, some of the bottom teams in, in the country. We were playing some good competition, playing well, but we just weren't successful. So. It was an op opportunity for us as a coaching staff and a, as a group of players to reflect on where we were at that time, uh, what we needed to do to change things, and then how were we going to you know, address those and move forward. And uh, we were able to do that. You know, we got everybody on the same page and, and got an understanding that uh, you know, we were very capable of playing at a high level. Uh, we just needed to get a few more pucks in the net and, and build our confidence up, and that's what we were able to do the last month of the season because our last two weekends, uh, we're set up at Minnesota for two games and then home against Ohio State. So we needed to be playing really at a high level that last weekend of the season and sort of reflect on, you know, where we were in January and where we we're going to be again at the end of February. And we had two good weekends against Minnesota and Ohio State and sort of got us in a position to get ready for the playoffs playing at a pretty good pace. There's so many amazing stories on this team, but I really feel like just from my point of view of, of learning about your team, over the last few days, the Cami Cronish might be one of the best ones. I mean, a goalie who essentially didn't play for four years and just sat in your program and bided her time. And then she emerges to become the most outstanding player of the Frozen Four. Give me a sense of, of her and how you kept her engaged. Or she literally played like a dozen games in four years and, and ends up as the most outstanding player. It's a pretty amazing story. It really is, and it's, it's probably more unique right now than uh, it's ever been just because of the space we're in and college athletics and the NILs and the transfer portals and, uh, and so many kids wanting you know, things right now and not maybe pushing themselves and looking at some adversities they may be in and uh, pushing themselves through that uh, to try to gain more playing time or more opportunities. And so I look at her story, and I shared it with our fans Monday at our celebration where you know, year one, she didn't play. Year two, she didn't play. Year three, she didn't play. You know, a sprinkle of games here uh, in year four and then, you know, made the decision uh, to come back her fifth year, not knowing if I was going to be the number one goaltending or not knowing what my opportunities were going to be in front of me. And yet she kept pushing herself, was a good teammate uh, throughout that period of time and uh, kept getting better and better. And all of a sudden uh, her opportunity was presented and she was prepared for it. And uh, you know, the last month of the season, we decided that she was going to be our, our, our go-to goalie. We were going to run with her. We gave her the baton, and uh, let's see where we can get there. And, uh, you know, to me, the icing on the cake was not only her shutout in the championship game, uh, but her opportunity that was presented. And uh, now all of a sudden she gets named national, you know, uh, tournament MVP. And so she's got something... Uh, that is very, very special that will be with her the rest of life. So I couldn't be more happy for her because she certainly earned it. Uh, it's an amazing story. Hey, I want to ask you a little bit uh, about your background and 
You were a great player in the NHL. We're going to get to the Olympic team in a moment because I'm really dying to talk to you about that. But I want to ask you about your dad, Bob, who, of course, was a legendary coach at the University of Wisconsin. You played for him. He went on to coach in the NHL. He won a Stanley Cup and, and then passed away quite prematurely. How much did his career choice influence what you chose to do once your playing career was over? And how much do you think about him in, in this context? Uh, you think about it a lot. Uh, you know, as I said at the press conference Sunday after the game up in Duluth, uh, you know, as I was going to the rink Sunday morning, uh, you know, you reflected back a bunch of years in 1981 when my dad was coaching here at Wisconsin, and uh, he took what we called at that time the backdoor Badgers. They sort of snuck into the tournament <laughs> that year and ended up winning the championship in Duluth uh, against a very, very strong Minnesota team. Actually, a couple of my former teammates were on that Minnesota team. Neil Broughton, who in 1981 was the first recipient of the Hobie Baker Award, had an outstanding season. Uh, his brother, you know, Aaron was on the team. He was a roommate of mine in New Jersey. We played for the Devils for five years. And then there was Butsy Erickson on that group out of Roseau. Those three kids obviously were one of the greatest lines in college hockey. And uh, my dad figured out how to beat him in 81 and uh, took the trophy back to Madison. So I thought to myself, how cool would it be if, you know, we were successful Sunday against Ohio State? that I could take that trophy back. And, uh, you know, my mom's living in Madison, so I got an opportunity Monday morning to take it over to where she's living and share that with her and reflect on 81. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was just a great day and certainly a great weekend for us here in Wisconsin. I know your mom's having some health struggles. Uh, what did it mean for you to be able to, to share that trophy with her? Yeah, it was special. Just, uh, you know, she was a big part of, uh, you know, building uh, the Wisconsin program. Uh, my dad came in here from Colorado College in the, in the middle 60s. And, you know, people that uh, would come out to the games in the early 70s and, and the 80s, uh, you know, always knew my mom was in the crowd because if the team wasn't playing very well, she could pull out her cowbell in front of 8,000 people and start ringing it, uh, whether it's Friday <laughs> or Saturday night at the, at the Coliseum to try to get the fans fired up, which would hopefully get the team fired up. And so she was obviously a big part of uh, Wisconsin, uh, you know, hockey and in the early days and certainly a big part uh, in the relationship she, she had with my father and whether it was in, you know, Madison here or when they went up to Calgary initially and spent five years up there with the Flames. Uh, and then most probably uh, important was uh, when they went to Pittsburgh and, and in that first year they ended up winning the Stanley Cup and uh, you know shortly after that uh, he ended up passing away but uh, she was a big part of you know the support that she gave my dad and, and the, the time commitment that he was able to, to do here in Madison and throughout uh, you know the United States uh, to promote hockey and uh, try to elevate the game to, to new heights and so uh, just getting an opportunity to bring that trophy back to her and as I've always said, uh, you know, those championship trophies bring out special smiles. I remember my dad won the cup uh, in Minneapolis against the North Stars. I happened to be at the game and going down to the locker room and watching him, you know, <laughs> hang on to the Stanley Cup. It just presents a, a unique smile. And so I got to see that again Monday when I put the trophy in front of my mom. Coach, I've got to ask you, I try very hard not to make interviews about me I try to make them about the interviewer but I've just got to tell you in talking to you I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you personally what an influence that 1980 team had on me as a young sports fan I was 10 years old I remember it as if it was clear as day I know you get this constantly you're in the hockey world everyone has their story about 1980 but but it was transformative I think from all of us who experienced it it's just remarkable. It's the greatest sporting event I've ever witnessed. And we, of course, didn't even get to witness it live when you guys beat the, the Russians. We did in the gold medal game. But like, how often do you think about that? I mean, I would think about it every waking moment if I were in your shoes. Uh, how often do you think about it? Well, every uh, February, you know, early middle of February, you know, the 22nd, the 24th, uh, I'll usually get text messages, emails, phone calls, interviews. So it's something that comes into my world that during that time, because, you know, this past February, uh, you know, the 43rd anniversary of it. And so it's, uh, it's something that, you know, again, uh, being part of such a small group that had a big impact, not only on each individual in their lives, but certainly a, a bigger platform that it presented, uh, 
And just hearing your story, that's probably what I hear from most people. So when they find out that you were part of this team in 1980 that won the gold medal, if they're old enough, because we're all getting older now, uh, you know, the younger generation will either relate something to the movie Miracle, or if they're old enough, they'll relate something to, you know, what age they were, what they were doing, and some of the stories that uh, myself and my teammates uh, have heard over the years, uh, some are hilarious, uh, some are interesting, and some are very unique. Does the younger generation, like, do they, does it resonate with them at all? Does it resonate with your players, like, how amazing this was, that this was, in my mind, still the greatest sports story maybe in my lifetime? Uh, it's just different because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sort of reflect sometimes, not very often, on maybe some of my experiences as a player, and I might relate a name, you know, like, you know, you might say, you know, yeah, I, I got an opportunity to play against uh, Ray Bork, and they'll look at you like, well, who, who's he? Who's, who'd he play for? <laughs> Some of the great players that I got a chance to play with or play against and, and whatnot. And so uh, it, it's interesting because uh, when you ask a question and you don't get much of an answer back, <laughs> it just makes you feel a little bit older. But, uh, you know, as they dig deep and they've got all these devices now where they can find out information pretty quickly and they find out, some of the things that you did as a player, or what you've done as a past coach, and uh, it might perk their ears up a little bit. Oh, wow, coach, coach was really good. <laughs> he may actually know what he's talking about. Uh, well, Mark Johnson, <laughs> re real thrill, to, to, real thrill to talk to you, and uh, thanks so much for your time. Congratulations on this championship and, and all your success with the Badgers. Thanks so much. It's nice visiting with you. Absolutely.